Hello and welcome to this special live presentation brought to you by ARC Specialties. I'm Tyler Kern. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let me give you a bit of a rundown so you know what to expect on today's broadcast. First, Dan Alford, president of ARC Specialties, is going to walk through the nine points to consider before you automate in regards to welding and cutting applications. After that, there's going to be a quick Q&A session, and Dan's going to welcome in a couple of his colleagues from ARC Specialties to answer some of your questions as well as some common questions about um, this particular aspect of the industry. And so that is going to come up. If you want to ask a question, you can do so over on the bottom right hand corner of the screen there in the comment section. So be sure to submit some questions to the guys and they'll be answering them in the second segment of the show today. But without further ado, let me turn it over to the man who is going to be leading us through the discussion today. It is Dan Alford, president of ARC Specialties. Dan, take it away. Hello, I'm, I'm Dan Alford with ARC Specialties, and I've been building robots and automated manufacturing systems for 40 years. And so what I've done is I've condensed those 40 years down to nine different points that we look at before we auto eat, automate any system. And that's what we wanted to share with you today is points to consider before you tackle an automation project. So. The first step is to determine whether a part can even be welded automatically. I work overseas a lot and I find it interesting, but people overseas are much more receptive to the idea of redesigning a part to facilitate automation. Over here, we've got too much bureaucracy and paperwork. So I'd like you to consider sometimes if your part can't be automated, maybe you should redesign it to facilitate manufacturing. And then what type of automation? PLC, robot, flexible, dedicated. Because if you only have one tool in your toolbox, you only have one solution in your toolbox. We're going to look at this whole array of different solutions. And is there a return on investment? Sometimes it's hard to justify, other times it's very easy. I'm gonna give you examples of both of these. So these are the points that I like to look at. Part size, part accuracy, weld acceptance criteria, welding process, joint configuration material thickness, production volume base metal, and the technical level at your facility. So let's look at each one of these independently. In school, they'll teach you that if you only have one part to make or a very small batch, let a human do it. No programming required, no investment. And sometimes that's the case. I'm gonna show you exceptions where we only had to do one part. But typically, if it's a low production volume, manual is the way to go. Now, if you have a mid-size volume, that means you can't dedicate a machine to one product all day long. That machine needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to do different types of parts. That's the definition of a robot, flexible automation. And then we've got the other column, dedicated optimization, dedicated automation. Sometimes you can optimize a machine to build a specific part very quickly and the precision and the production rates are actually better that way. So look at all three of these. Part size. So the large parts violate the keep it simple stupid principle. You know, it affects the work envelope. Being a guy that sells robots, I don't mind selling a travel unit to expand a robot's envelope, but this add cost to your system. Weight capacity. That we're welding an armored vehicle here, so you can imagine we have tons of weight that we're having to manipulate. Uh, adds complexity to your project. And large parts are generally less accurate because dimensional accuracy is a function of length. And then large parts require more programming time. So we're gonna look at point three, two different ways. First, what's your part accuracy if you don't have any form of adaptive control? If you don't have adaptive control, the robot has to make assumptions about where the part is, where the weld joint is. And so typically we'll tell people you need to have your part accurately positioned relative to the robot within one wire diameter. Since most people are MIG welding with an 045 wire, that means you have to be within 45 thousandths of an inch to weld without adaptive control. And that's not just part accuracy, that's fixturing accuracy, robot accuracy, total stack up. We also need to have accurate clamping points, something that we can grip the part, and we need to have repeatable joint gaps in order to weld blind. Can it be done? Absolutely, but you have to meet these criteria. Now, part accuracy, if you have adaptive control, this changes the game. So now you have to have searchable features. By that, I mean, if you're welding a square butt, for example, it's kind of hard to find that square butt with tactile probes or through the arc tracking. All of a sudden you need lasers. So we have to have some kind of searchable feature that your sensor technology can find and locate. And the cycle times are longer. Whenever we do a demo in our lab and we're going to use touch work or any of these other adaptive technologies, I like to demonstrate them to the customer because you can drastically increase your cycle time when you're searching the part, particularly if you're having to search for both ends of the weld. You have to be able to program these adaptive systems. 
So it adds to your cost. And the whole system cost is frequently higher. The one here is a good example. That's a laser stripe tracker to measure left and right and uh, offset. And then on top, we're using uh, automatic torch height control. So you're looking at a combination there of over $30,000 worth of adaptive control. Necessary for this pipe weld, but adds cost to the system. Weld acceptance criteria. The perfect joint is a partial penetration joint. If you're trying to wake a full pin joint where you weld it from the outside and get a good joint on the inside, that's tough. I also like partial length joints. We rarely get the luxury of not having to weld to an edge, but it greatly simplifies your task if you can let that weld stop just before the edge. Then you don't have to know exactly where the side of that point joint is. Cosmetic criteria. So how pretty does this part need to be? If there's going to be a subsequent machining operation, that changes the game. And leak-proof welds, these are always tough because after you weld them, we've got to test them. Welding process. I'm going to break this down into each of the processes. We're going to start with MIG because that's most commonly used welding automation process. It's low cost. It's tolerant of misalignment, particularly if you run metal cord wires. Uh, it's simple. People understand it. You have good deposition rates. We've welded close to 20 pounds an hour. And you have to understand productivity in welding is not inches per minute, it's pounds per hour. So close to 20 pounds an hour, that, that's doable. You have some high travel speeds. Uh, we've been welding upwards of 100 inches a minute. So it's, it lends itself to that, but there's limitation on alloys because if you can't make your metal into a wire, you can't MIG weld with it. The next step up the ladder would be TIG welding. Very low defect rate. Uh, but it adds another variable wire positioning. So you actually have to lead or trail, depending on whether you're running hot wire or cold wire, the arc with the wire. That means if you're using a six axis robot, that last axis is devoted to doing nothing but positioning that wire. So you no longer have that six axis for positioning of other things. Uh, very relatively low deposition rates, typically is one to two pounds an hour. That's a tenth of what I mentioned with MIG. Now we violate that rule with hot wire. If you preheat the wire, with a constant voltage power supply, then all of a sudden you can hit deposition rates over 10 pounds an hour. So that, that encroaches up on the MIG welding deposition rates. One big problem is tungsten contamination. If you've ever TIG welded, you know that once you dip that tungsten or contaminate it with wire, you've got to stop and grind the tungsten, which takes us to plasma. Plasma is a great process. It's, it's underappreciated. It's wonderful for automation. You get a collimated arc. That means instead of a diverging arc, like you'd have with a TIG welder, you have a laser beam. And so your cathode spot, your arc spot remains constant, independent of torch height. That means your current density, your amps per square inch remains constant. That means your heat input remains constant. Greatly simplifies the process. But the tungsten is also shrouded up inside the torch, so you don't contaminate the tungsten. Seems like a minor advantage, but it prevents you from having to stop and clean the tungsten frequently. And we're able to run powder feed rather than wire feed. You can run wire feed, but with powders, all of a sudden we're able to weld things that can't be made into a wire. So high cobalt alloys, um, molybdenum, rhenium, uh, we've even welded pure tungsten. So it opens up uh, your possibilities on alloys quite a bit. And with the right torches, all of a sudden you have a torch that can weld in any direction because the powder feeds from all the way around. That eliminates that six axis issue. Highest equipment cost, because if you count them, there's actually three power supplies, the arc starter, the pilot arc, and the main arc. And generally lower deposition rates, but uh, we have an example where we're up at 20 pounds an hour. So not always. Submerged arc welding, 100-year-old welding process, obsolete, right? Not in my opinion. This is a great process, extremely high deposition rates. We're up above 40 pounds an hour now. Nothing can touch electron beam, I mean, excuse me, submerged arc welding at all. Very low defect rate because you have a deep weld, deep penetrating weld. It's good for thick sections only, but uh, we've welded as thin as... Uh, 332nd of an inch, so, but typically you run it on larger sections. There's problems with slag removal, but if the robot has the ability to chip the slag itself, we can eliminate that. You have problems associated with piping in the uh, flux, but there's ways to get around that. We pump it in like a, with a sandblast type approach. And really the biggest problem with submerged arc welding, it only works in the flat position, but that works out to my advantage because we're motion guys. So if we can coordinate the position of the torch and the parts simultaneously, all of a sudden we can weld parts with submerged arc welding, which you couldn't do before. It requires coordinated motion though. So joint configuration. 
If I have a choice, I'd prefer to weld a lap joint or a fillet joint. Searchable features, partial penetration joints, easy to weld. Groove joints are fine. I generally prefer a U-groove. Now we've got exceptions to that. If we add enough adaptive control, we are now able to weld full penetration V-grooves, but generally a U-groove is preferred. Square butts are tough because I don't have anything to track on. With the exception of that is laser sight tracking. We can actually square track a square butt joint now with laser stripe. So anything's possible. Material thickness. So thin parts are a problem because they tend to distort. Thin parts can easily be burned through. And then thick parts are typically inaccurate, you know, either due to loose tolerances or production problems. So there's a sweet spot in the middle on thickness. Base material, mild steel, easy to weld, tolerant to some contamination on the surface, good strong welds, uh, everybody knows how to weld it. High strength, low alloy steel. Welds very similarly, but it typically requires preheat. Not a problem. We can integrate both flame preheat and induction preheat, but it requires cost, additional complexity to add the preheat to the system. Aluminum requires good part cleanliness, raises the bar a little bit. And then when you get to the exotic alloys, titaniums, nickels, and other reactive metals, all of a sudden oxidation becomes critical. But there's always ways around it. The, the weld on the bottom of this picture here is actually a titanium weld that's the bottom of a full penetration, single-sided keyhole weld welded outside of a chamber. So these things can be done. And my final point is the technical capabilities of your facility. The man-machine interface must fit your operator. The one on the left is the, uh, a full-blown CNC system that we built. Very powerful tool, rather challenging to program and operate. On the right, very simple system. It's nothing but knobs and buttons. Which one fits your shop? You try to shove the wrong thing down an operator's throat, things will go badly. We also need to know, is your operator going to be the setup and programmer? If that's the case, we either need a pretty sharp operator or an operator that we can train. If all of a sudden you have engineers that are doing this and they're not on the floor running the machine at the same time, then we can raise the technology level. And finally, is the shop receptive to automation? More often than not, we go into a shop and we get a lot of pushback initially. But after people see that this is actually a labor-saving device and it's going to make their company more competitive, they embrace it. But initially, we have to get over that fear of robotics. So those are my nine points. And in my career, this, this part right here, this is from the 80s, that's how long it's been, is the only one I've ever had that actually fit all my acceptance criteria. It's the part size is tolerable. The part accuracy is good. The weld acceptance criteria, this is just a shackle for a uh, suspension pickup, not too hard to hit. The welding process was gas metal arc welding. The joint configuration, that's my favorite. That's a flare bevel. Uh, material thickness is thick enough that we don't have any burn through issues. Production volume was huge, so we justified automation. Base metal is mild steel, doesn't get any better. And this company was familiar with robots. So this was a good robotic solution and uh, what, I, what I forgot to point out is that we also didn't have to weld to the ends. Perfect joint. That's the only one I've had in 40 years. So let's talk about the real world, my world. So how are we going to get around the limitations of these parts that violate my nine principles? First off, we have to figure out if you want dedicated automation or flexible automation, you make that decision. You need to figure out what kind of adaptive control. I find it interesting. Some of the most sophisticated shops I'm working in still use human override. And it actually makes sense because people are very good at adapting to things. So in this picture here, we're making a cut on a, in the field and we had the human make the final course corrections with a joystick. It's a viable solution. The next step up on adaptive control be automatic archive control. That means we're monitoring either the voltage or the current or both, and we're following the contour of the part automatically. So that's a Z axis only adaptive control. Next one is touch work. We can go in and find the part by using the, uh, the tip of the wire. We energize the wire and we find out when we touch, we can find the start point and we can find the end point. We can actually change the vector of the torch path. The next step up would be through the arc tracking. We're doing the same thing. We're using current or voltage, but we're having to oscillate. And using the oscillation, we can now track across the weld as well as vertically. 
I like these systems, everything from here up, all my solutions are good because the torch is the sensor. There's no misalignment between the sensor and the torch, works out well. The last two, you have an independent sensor, you have laser stripe tracking, like I showed you on the pipe earlier, where we're monitoring group works very well, but there's an offset and that offset has to be calibrated between the laser stripe and the torch. And finally, we're doing laser part mapping. It's an interesting new technology where we go and map all the way around a part. This allows the robot to write its own program. Kind of exciting. Then we pick a prog uh, processor, either programmable logic controllers, personal computers, CNCs, or robots. You still have to go through a cost justification. Are you simply trying to reduce labor, increase your arc on time, increase part acceptance? I put some systems in China and I was surprised that they'd spent so much money on automated machines. And their response was to compete in a global economy, a manually welded part's no longer acceptable. I thought, ah, interesting. So people are going to find this is the case more and more. And frequently removing the welder from a hazardous environment might be your goal. The part may be preheat, may be radioactive, may be dangerous, may be toxic, whatever, but that can justify uh, automation even with low production rates. So here's my second example. This is a thermocouple oil, I'll cut it in half. So part size is good, part accuracy is very good. It's all machine parts. Acceptance criteria, no, it's not that hard. It was a partial penetration joint. Uh, but the welding process, they insisted that this be a TIG weld. And so that, that adds a little complexity. The joint configuration was good. We're able to simply move the torch in a vertical axis only, required no cross seam adjustment at all. The material thickness was good, no burn through issues. Production volume was good, base metal, stainless, not too bad, very doable. But the problem was they had no welders on staff. They actually wanted their shipping clerk to run this machine. So we had to come up with a machine that was pretty simple to operate. So this one is a good example of when you have buttons and knobs. So this was actually operated by a shipping clerk. Shipping clerk was quite pleased when they were able to make successful welds. Uh, but really uh, the, the, the key to solution on this project was to make the machine easy to operate. So here's an actual Arcon video of it running. It says the tungsten electrode. You can see that we're welding the groove in the bottom there. This is a pallet rack. If you have pallet rack in your shop, we may have welded it for you. So these welds on the outside here are welded. Uh, the, the problem was the part size, not so much the width of the part, but the length of the part. These parts are 20 foot long. And as you can imagine with roll form parts, 20 foot long, if I hold this in, the other end isn't accurate within inches. And again, we have to hit it within a wire diameter, simply not practical. Everything else looked pretty good except the material thickness, very thin, and yet they wanted high productivity. This is a commodity. They wanted to weld at 75 inches a minute. And to weld that fast, you weld pretty hot. When you weld that hot, it's easy to burn through. So our solution was this. It's a system, a dedicated system, and we clamped the part in place only where we're trying to weld it, rather than try to clamp the entire thing together, which might might have been impossible. We figured it was impossible. We just clamped where we needed to weld it and the torches moved with the clamps. So only a small piece of this part was dimensionally accurate at any given moment, but that was the part we were welding on. Then we ran metal cord wires so we could weld this thing at 75 inches a minute and a few other little tricks like we never stopped to start the weld. If we'd have actually stopped, we probably would have had some burn through issues, but starting on the fly made it work. So worked out pretty well. So this is a armor plate. So this is very heavy. There's nothing good about it. The part size is too big. Acceptance criteria, they wanted to x-ray every part. Welding process was buried arcs. This is something I'd only seen in a textbook before we built the system. Joint configuration, this is a strange ballistic joint, but the hard part is the last half inch is, feel, is fully penetration. So it's a tough joint. You have to hit that joint and then make the penetration. Material thickness is thick. Production volumes are atrocious. They're only shipping two or three of these a month. Base material is aluminum, not my favorite. And, uh, but the good news was the technical level of this shop was pretty good. So this is the system we used. We're using a human override to weld this thing. It takes big equipment to build big parts. It worked pretty well. I've got a little video here in case you've never seen buried arc welding. And uh, buried arc's an interesting process. So we're running up to 600 amps and uh, volts in the middle 30s. Very high energy process, only works in the flat position. That's why we're having to manipulate the part in real time while we were making these joints, but uh, worked out pretty well. 
One last one. These are out of order, but I like this project. This is a neutron detector. So this is a very thin wall tube. Uh, part size are good, accuracy is good. One problem is they had variable part size from six inches to six feet. Machine parts, but the weld acceptance criteria was very strict. We had to pass helium leak detest detection on each part. And they wanted to weld this with DC. Typically on aluminum, you'll run with AC. Joint configuration looked pretty good. We're welding a 30 thousandths part though. That's, so the material thickness was pretty bad. And the base material was aluminum, not my favorite. But uh, so what we ended up doing, this is a dedicated part. And, but there's enough production volume that we could justify automatic load and unload on this machine. So we've got two torches welding simultaneously with DC. The pulsing you see is the pulsing of the current to allow us to penetrate repeatedly and reliably. You'll see the little robot underneath grab the part out at the end of the joint, throw it into the uh, outfeed conveyor and pick up yet a new one. I promised you at the beginning of this talk that I'd have too many examples. So I've got another 10 more, but I'm gonna spare you. So Johnny is going to put this online. So we'll be able to, you'll be able to look at it at your own time if you'd like to later. But we're gonna take a little break now and then we're going to Q and A immediately afterward. Thanks for attending. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching along as Dan brought us those nine points. Dan, thank you for sharing and uh, bringing us all of those examples. A reminder, you can go check out all of Dan's examples online as Johnny's gonna put them up there on the Arc Specialties website. Coming up, we're gonna have the Q&A session, so make sure to keep submitting questions there on the website down in the bottom right-hand comment section. But before that, we're gonna show a quick video that really illustrates how Arc Specialties is empowering welders. So watch this. Superior Cladding is a company that provides a service, oftentimes for groups like refineries, oil and natural gas, with regards to making things rust resistant or wear resistant. The Superior Cladding's partnership working with Arc Specialties has been since day one. The products and equipment that Arc Specialty makes is not useful at this company, it is vital. There are other companies out there that integrate robotics, that try to make cladding equipment, and none of them quite do it like ARC for three reasons. One, ARC builds their own machines or their equipment. Two, ARC is as much a software company as it is a hardware company. They make the software, and three, they make it usable for the people actually on the floor. for the welding operators that are actually doing the work. It makes it so much cleaner to make a good sound weld because they have controls to do it by hand and they can also do it by the machine on the front end. In the industries we work in, most companies can get stuck in a rut. Here at Superior Cladding, we say that's not good enough, there's a way to do it better. And if there isn't, we prove it. Our partnership with Arc Specialties helps explore that question, is there a better way to do it? Welcome back to this live presentation brought to you by Arc Specialties. I'm Tyler Kern. We're going to kick it back over to Dan Alford and the guys who's welcoming John Martin and Dave Hebel. They're going to be answering some questions, some common questions from the industry, as well as some of your uh, your questions from those of you watching uh, watching along with us today. So let me kick it back over to Dan Alford and the guys at Arc Specialties. Uh, thanks, Tyler. Um, got a couple good questions. So the, my favorite question that came up uh, during Dan's presentation uh, is directed to Dave here. Uh, and the question is, will a robot solve my welding problems? Will it solve my problems? It depends on the problem. Uh, everybody likes to blame the welder. Uh, but the good news, robots don't get tired. They don't need to take a break. Uh, they don't care if it's hot. They don't get hungry. They show up for work every day. <laughs> and they don't come in hungover. And uh, bad news is a robot only knows how to do the same thing over and over. So if it's a weld quality problem, one of the things you have to look at is it's part fit up. And is the welder trying to cover up for poor fit up? And uh, one of the things that when you talk about consistency, um, welding doesn't start at the welding booth. Welding may start back at the, the cutting table, the shear, the press break. And so if you have inconsistent part fit up, we may need to take a serious look 
at what's happening upstream right. so that we know we're feeding good parts in it and the welder's just mm -hmm. not uh, trying to cover up. Well, uh, a lot of time we'll go in for a welding problem and have a cutting robot application. We'll sell them a cutting robot because they have right. poor fit up. Right. And as mentioned, you can uh, look at touch sense, laser and vision tracking systems through the arc. It all costs money and it all takes time away from arc on time. So anyway, good question. Uh, John, got a question for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, why is part fixturing such a high cost of an automated system? I've seen people kind of choke over a price uh, on fixturing. Right, right. Uh, yeah, a lot of time, uh, a major cost of the uh, of a solution is in the fixturing. Um, but that's kind of leads into what you said, uh, fit up, fit up, fit up, right? Mm -hmm. That's the three reasons. Um, if a part uh, has variation in it, it might not be a good automated uh, welding process until you get the fixturing to hold that part into position. Uh, like Dan said in his presentation, it's a rule of thumb is uh, one wire width, di one diameter of the wire. Uh, so it could be up to uh, 035 or 045 tolerance that you're looking at. Um, the other reason the complexity and cost is it has to be robust enough to hold those parts in position, but movable so you can load and unload the part. Uh, so there's a lot of design that goes into that. And a lot of our engineers' time is in how to fixture the customer's parts. And, and from a commercial perspective, it's, it's a bit of a an issue mm -hmm. on customization because the robots have become quite a commodity now, but all these fixtures are custom built, custom designed. So you don't get the, uh, the commodity savings that you get. Right. right. It's pretty much a, a purpose built piece of equipment for the customer's parts. Oh, uh, Dan mentioned uh, in his presentation, keyhole welding. A uh, question came up at asking, what is that? You didn't define that, did you? No, I didn't define that. <laughs> in, in plasma welding, uh, if you turn it with enough amps and you turn the gas flow up so that the pressure of the arc actually blows all the way through the thickness of the material. And uh, if you look on the bottom side, you can see the arc coming out the bottom. And looking from the top, it looks like a keyhole. Uh, going all the way through the plate. So as the torch progresses, the metal melts and flows around the hole and closes up behind it, forming the weld. On the backside, and on both sides. Both sides. Yeah, yeah and, and before everybody gets excited about <laughs> keyhole welding everything, it requires extremely precise joints because we're typically not adding any material and there's uh, uh, thickness limitations. limitations right. Now on the space shuttle, they welded the fuel tanks using keyhole and that was an inch thick, but that was a special case. The thickest we've done at ARC here is three eighths of an inch. Right. So there's limited applications, but when it works, it's amazing. And thicker than that, you can do a bevel, keyhole the room and then just fill. Mm -hmm. So it's plasma keyhole. Uh, another question we have, John, uh, mm -hmm. can we add multiple welding processes to the same automated system? Uh, yes, we can, but um, whenever you try to add multiple processes, and uh, uh, if you go for a cutting application and a welding application, that's uh, my favorite. But if you try to uh, do a plasma weld with a wire feed MIG process, uh, I, I call it uh, sacrifices in design. You always have some type of design you have to uh, think about and it sacrifices your production levels. So, I mean, it can be as simple as cable management. You know, what do you do with the other cables or how do you connect the other processes uh, to the system? Um, so you can, yes, uh, depends on your cycle times. Um, so if you have high production requirements, um, I would prefer a dedicated system that uh, is able to generate that production requirements. But if you have a cyclic type of production requirements and you need a different uh, welding process to justify the machine, then it is possible. Okay. Yeah, we, we've built dozens that were multi-process, but typically they end up being used primarily for one process only. I think the best exception to that is our own shop where we have a robot that's both MIG welding and plasma cutting, but does it at different times of the day. Okay, any other questions? That's all I had uh, from okay. our, our presentation, but okay. That's all we got. Mm -hmm. That's all we got. So that pretty much covers it for today. We really appreciate everybody attending. Uh, if this was beneficial to you, please give us a note or don't hesitate to call us uh, and we, we could put some more of these on. 
And everyone, thank you so much for uh, watching along with us today. For more from ARC Specialties, make sure to go to arcspecialties.com. You can learn more about what they were talking about today there on the website. Make sure to drop them a line if you have further questions. And stay tuned because we'll be back soon with more broadcasts just like this one. Let us know what you would like to learn more about and hear more about from ARC Specialties and the experts over there. Thank you once again to Dan, John, and Dave for joining us today. And once, uh, once again, we'll be back soon. But until then, I've been your host today, Tyler Kern. Thanks for watching.